When I left my homeland in Guatemala and headed north with my brother Enrique, I did so out of fear and desperation. My father was beheaded by the military for trying to organize a union, and I feared for my life. My family had discussed coming to the US before. They had heard all the people, even the poor, own their own cars. But I wasn't thinking about owning a car when I fled my home and made the dangerous trek to the US-Mexico border. What I thought about was making it here at any cost, even if it meant crawling through the sewer and being bitten by rats. In the movie El Norte that they made about my life, I died of typhus contracted from those rat bites. But what if I didn't die? Here's what could have happened. When I regained consciousness in the hospital, I woke up to see the most beautiful being I'd ever laid eyes on. For a second, I thought I had died and gone to heaven and was looking at an angel because everybody knows that angels in heaven are fair with blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> at least that's what they look like in all of the pictures I saw in Guatemala. Blonde, blue eyes, beautiful smile with perfect white teeth, and huge glowing feathered wings. That's what angels look like. They never look like me or anyone I knew in Guatemala. No small, dark angels with black hair. <laughs> no, never. But the angel I woke up to had no wings, but he had everything else. And when he said my name, Rosa, 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 I wanted to stay in that moment, that instant forever and ever. Rosa. You are in the hospital. We almost lost you for a minute there, but you're awake now. And he took my hand in his, took my pulse. <laughs> es doctor, I said to myself. I had to smile. A doctor, not an angel. A good doctor, a good man, a kind man. And he took such interest in, in me during my hospital stay and recuperation that I would fantasize Dr. Hartman, yes, Hartman, <laughs> falling in love with me and asking me to marry him and me getting my papers and having his blonde, blue-eyed, angelic children. But it turned out that the doctor's interest was because he was looking for a nanny. <laughs> yeah, his wife was pregnant. and. He said he'd never met anyone as nice as me, and he wanted his child to learn to be kind, and what better way? When he asked me if I would work for him and his wife, I was heartbroken. But I said, yes. I mean, he had saved my life, and it, it was the least I could do to show my gratitude. Work for him and his wife, raise their child. At least I would be near him. I worked for the Hartmans for three years. They encouraged me to study English at night school, and they sponsored me to get my documents. Yes, that was possible back then. But I was lonely, so lonely. I heard from Enrique living in Chicago less and less. He was making his life there, but he was lonely too. Loneliness is not considered an illness, but it's a condition that many immigrants suffer. Loneliness, longing, la soledad. Because when you arrive here, everything is different, especially you, because people think you are different, look at you like you're different, talk to you different, like you can't understand, like you're stupid. They over-enunciate like, may I see your ID? your identification. Nothing is familiar. The food, the smells, the air you breathe. You long for your land, your people, your life, you. 
One night I had a dream about my mother. She was surrounded by white butterflies and she was cradling my father's head. I said, I miss you, Mama. I am lonely. I am sad. I am sending you love, she said. I met Juan in my English class, where I met most of my friends, friends who would get together on our days off and share stories about our homeland, Guatemala, Mexico, El Salvador, and stories about our jobs, our bosses, about the crazy Americanos, esos gringos locos. We'd share our foods and we'd share our music, our art, our culture, books. What most Americanos don't realize is that most people schooled in Mexico and Latin America get a pretty good education. We are well read, know our history, and sometimes we even know American history better than they do. Our time together, me and my friends, was our refuge, our group. It became our tribe. Everybody needs a tribe. It helped me. It made me feel less lonely. The day I heard someone speaking my language, not Spanish, but my indigenous language, quiche, sacric, I heard one say, shekich, and I cried with happiness. Juan joined our tribe of lonely people. He was kind, gentle, smart, short, dark, and handsome. He made me laugh, and he played the guitar and sang songs in Spanish and in Quiche. He reminded me of who I used to be. We fell in love, we got married. I stopped working for the Hartmans just before we had our first child, Juan Jr. Juan and I called him Johnny because it sounded more American. We had two more kids, and Juan and I had to work hard to support this family. I cleaned houses, and he worked first as a gardener, and then he started his own gardening service. We raised good kids who got good grades and stayed out of trouble. At bedtime, I would tell them stories about growing up in Guatemala, not the part about my father's murder and getting his head chopped off, but I'd tell them about walking barefoot, swimming in the river, picking juicy mangoes right off of the tree and eating them without even washing them. I tell them about my mother and my grandmother and about my brother who lived in Chicago. We made a good life together, me and Juan. We were never rich and I never owned my own car, but still he made me laugh. We treated each other with honor and respect, and we shared a deep and profound love. We bought a home and our kids went to college. Johnny went to Stanford, Julia went to UCLA, and Raymond dropped out of Cal State LA and went into the gardening business. When Johnny graduated, he wanted to visit my homeland, and so we went together. I took him to the town I grew up in, which was no longer the town I grew up in. It still looked and smelled like I remembered it, but it wasn't the same. Now I was there with my son, Johnny, who didn't speak Spanish very well, much less quiche. And he was so American. I was both proud and embarrassed at the same time. We visited relatives, ate good food, embraced, laughed, cried, reminisced, and it was then that I realized that I could never go back, not to Guatemala, not to that time, not to who I used to be. I realized that it wasn't my land that had changed. I had changed. I was more American than I realized, and it made me sad, like when you remember a lost friend or an old heartbreak. And as I sat on the beach with Johnny, watching the sunset, I longed for my home. I longed for Los Angeles. Today, Johnny's a partner at a large law firm in Century City. He married Eliza, also an attorney, 
and she's Jewish, which makes their kids Jew-Watamalans. <laughs> Julia is a state assembly woman and is married to a professor of Chicana Chicano studies at UCLA. Raymond married his partner, Larry, African American. They're in the process of adopting biracial twins and they have a very successful gardening business. As for me and Juan, we are retired and enjoying what is called La Tercera Edad, the third age. We spend our days working in our garden, reading books, and singing Spanish and Quiche songs we learned when we were young. At least that's what could have happened.